The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, my name is Frederick Shaw, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of Public Health Reports, the official journal of the Office of the U.S. Surgeon General and the United States Public Health Service. My colleague, Dr. Andre Kuzmichev, the PHR Managing Editor, and I welcome you to the ASPPH Presents Public Health Reports Meet the Author webinar, presented to stimulate discussion around current topics in public health. Today's ASPPH Presents Public Health Reports Meet the Author webinar discusses from local action to national progress on five major health challenges. The webinar will include public health perspectives on violence reduction, the opioid epidemic, obesity and the food system, environmental challenges, adolescent disconnection, and a discussion of public health tools and a brief summary of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. The speakers will be available for questions from webinar participants. So on behalf of the U.S. Surgeon General Vice Admiral Jerome Adams, I want to thank Dr. Ellen McKenzie, Dean and Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, Director of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, Ms. Michelle Spencer, Associate Director of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, and the Bloomberg School of Public Health team for joining us today. This and all PHR webinars are archived on the ASPPH website for future viewing, and the question and answer session will follow today's presentation. To submit a question for after the presentation, type your question into the chat question box, which is opened by clicking the small white arrows that are in the upper right corner of your screen. If you are interested in seeking one credit for certification in public health continuing education practice instruction, you'll be given a password at the conclusion of the webcast. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ellen McKenzie, Dean and Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Let us begin our presentation. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Shaw, um, for inviting us to participate in today's webinar. And I'd also like to begin by thanking you and your team uh, at Public Health Reports for the incredible work you did and the partnership uh, we had in, in uh, producing the supplement. Uh, you're, you provided incredible um, reviews that were very helpful in, in producing the final product. So thank you very much. The issue um, of public health, the special issue of public health reports was released in November. And, in, and very interestingly, just a couple of weeks before the announcement by CDC that life expectancy in the United States has now fallen over the past three years. This dismal news has led many uh, to ask what's behind the faltering health of our country and what can we do about it? We've been asking those questions ourselves and much of our thinking is reflected in the articles of this supplement, which is devoted to American health. Specifically, the supplement includes papers that provide a public health perspective on the five major health challenges that are facing our country, which Dr. Shaw mentioned, namely addiction and overdose, environmental challenges, obesity in the food system, and risks, risks to adolescent health and violence. Now, these are uh, five very complicated problems, each of which casts a long shadow across the country. These problems reflect complicated social realities and deep inequities, but they, are also, they also can be understood, analyzed, and addressed. Not coincidentally, these five problems are the focus areas of a new project of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. The initiative uh, sponsored this supplemental issue, and its director, Josh Sharfstein, and associate director, Michelle Spencer, are here with us today. Josh and Michelle, would you like to say something about the initiative and then guide us through the papers that we'll be hearing about today? Sure. Uh, thank you, Ellen, and, and thank you, um, Dr. Shaw. It is a pleasure to be here with you all. The Bloomberg American Health Initiative aims to use the tools of public health to impact some of the most pressing challenges to health in this country. Uh, our website is americanhealth.jhu.edu 
And here you can find information on our fellowship program, which offers full scholarships for the MPH and DRPH degree, our initial research results, and updates on practice efforts taking place in partnership with schools and programs of public health and with local and state governments uh, across the country. That's um, AmericanHealth.jhu.edu. Um, now, uh, Michelle, I think, uh, believes that I mentioned the website too much. <laughs> yes, Josh, I do. In fact, I believe that we all think that. Um, I'd like to just give a brief history um, behind this supplement. So the Bloomberg American Health Initiative was created in 2016 with a gift from Bloomberg Philanthropies to celebrate the 100th anniversary of our school. In 2017 and early 2018, the, initial, the initiative held symposia in each of the five focus areas, bringing together top experts, practitioners, and people with lived experiences from across the country. These gatherings really inform the papers in the supplement that we're about to talk about. Um, we've also uh, like to point out that across the five focus areas, the Bloomberg American Health Initiative is committed to three cross-cutting themes. These themes are policy, evidence, and equity. There's papers on each in the supplement as well. If you're interested in learning more about the history of the initiative to date, there's a final paper that explains its origin, its approach, as well as its goals. Great, thank you very much, Michelle. Now it's time to jump into the supplement itself. We're going to have presentations by authors of the papers um, and then have some time for questions. So we're going to start with um, Professor Tom Burke. And Tom is going to talk about um, the paper called Building Healthy Community Environments, a Public Health Approach. Thank you, Josh. I I want to give a shout out to my colleague and, and lead author, Kirsten Kohler, who's also here today. And I, I want to begin by saying we all know these are very challenging times for the environment and environmental health. You don't have to go further than the front page of the newspapers to know that uh, many of, of our uh, public health efforts in, in environmental health are being challenged from the, uh, the air quality of the air we breathe to the source waters that provide us drinking water. This is a challenging time, but it's a great time to rethink things. And, and our efforts really have been about rethinking environmental health. In fact, environmental health is, is going through an, an awful lot of changes, even the practice on the front lines, where our health departments had traditionally been organized to, uh, to really address issues of sanitation and infectious disease, we're realizing more and more that there's a tremendous burden of disease uh, from the environment, particularly from the built environment. So from cardiovascular health uh, to respiratory health to really the safety of our streets, decisions about the built environment are public health decisions and it's time for a new approach. The environment matters across all of these major challenges that we have in the Bloomberg Initiative. I think we're going to go try for the next slide here. I think I might need control. There we go. Okay. So this is the busiest slide in the entire presentation. <laughs> Forgive me. So, uh, but, but Josh asked that we put the framework there. Let me give you the message of, of, of this slide. It's, it's really about systems thinking in the environment. Those of us in environmental health know we've divided the environment into compartments, air, water, waste. And we've also divided the environment into programs to address them without looking at the big picture, that the built environment really makes a huge difference in our health. So if you just focus on two parts of this slide, the far left and the far right, the current state is that we have an enormous burden of environmentally related diseases, due in part to the poor community design that we have, particularly in our most vulnerable areas. We have aging, infrastructure, if you think of Flint, Michigan, we have inadequate green space. Uh, we have disaster susceptibility in our coastal areas and, and, and other areas, certainly with a changing climate, we see that more and more. But we also have issues with transit uh, and our transportation system. Anyone who sat in traffic today knows the, the impacts of that on all of our lives. 
and we also have very energy intensive decisions about how we use land, water, agriculture. So what are we talking about with systems thinking? We're talking about cross-sector collaborations. Public health has to get outside of our relatively narrow lanes or silos and understand that public health decisions need our involvement and need the inclusion of cross-sector collaborations from city and regional planners to architects, to small businesses, to housing agencies and parks and recreation, and really including the communities and decisions about our built environment. There's lots of great emerging tools from a health impact assessment to guide us through the decisions about the environment, to cumulative risk assessment, to environmental public health tracking, to use data to, to inform decisions. And we can change public health practice to be more health informed. Again, community decisions should be health decisions. But this is also gonna mean that we change our educational process, internships for our students in other sectors, training and reaching out to planners and others, reaching policymakers and research that's applied. Our desired state on the far end is that we get to healthy environments, improve health from cardiovascular to cancer to asthma and violence, um, and that we can help through healthier communities to have more resilient, healthy lives. Last slide. And so to sum it up, we have a set of conclusions and recommendations. One, we need a new way to define the problem, recognizing that public health impacts all community decisions. We need a seat at the table through new partnerships with planners, developers, transportation and housing. We can fill the gaps on health and environment, be part of the decision making, applying new tools like health impact assessment, developing metrics that expand on our current surveillance efforts like environmental public health tracking. We can really inform decisions. We also have to train our public health professionals in a different way across the agency, across disciplinary really rethinking our approach to environmental health and moving beyond traditional roles to reduce the burden of disease through healthy communities. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you very much, Tom. And um, we're gonna transition to the next um, paper, but um, come back at the end for questions. And people can put in their questions uh, using the screen where it says questions. And I also wanna point out to everybody that the entire initiative, is, uh, the entire supplement is open access, and it's available at bit.ly slash amhealth, A-M-H-E-L-T-H. So uh, you can find all the papers at bit.ly slash amhealth. Um, I believe our next um, topic trying to, is um, adolescent health, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Kristen Mari and Tamar Mendelson, um, who have, were the uh, co-authors of the paper on opportunity use. So I'll turn it over to you, Kristen, tomorrow. Thank you. Great. Well, happy to be here. And just to give you a little summary for what we are talking about is we're focusing on a uh, population, a specific segment of the adolescent population, which we refer to as opportunity use. And that's a positive way for really framing that these are young people between the ages of 16 to 24 years old, years old who are not working and they're not in school. And so many people call them disconnected youth. Um, the reason why we're focusing on this is in large part, public health has typically ignored this population as a whole. And so to really bring public health to the forefront of this issue, we are gonna hopefully use the tools that we have to really um, look at this population more deeply. And one of the reasons that's so important is because opportunity youth that face incredible challenges in terms of navigating the transition to adulthood. So they have really high risks of long-term emotional, behavioral, and health problems um, compared to young people who are not disconnected from school or from work. Um, and these are big costs, so it certainly affects the lives of young people. These young people are much more likely to be unemployed, to have um, problems with the juvenile justice or criminal justice system, um, and to experience homelessness and even earlier mortality. And society also bear, bears a high cost 
um, for all of the different expenses associated with opportunity youth. So we really want to think about public health approaches to reducing the number of opportunity youth in this country. And just to add, we call them opportunity youth positively because we believe that if we can really invest in them, they were going to have potential to really thrive and have opportunities ahead of them. So um, on the left of this slide is a conceptual model that may be a little bit hard to read, so I'll kind of try to talk through this. But we come from a positive youth development perspective. And we really believe that um, all young people have potential to thrive and that we're all really impacted by risk and protective factors are in our environment. So on the top half of this figure, you can see that individuals are embedded within these different sort of context and layers, family, school and friends, community, and then the broader society and policy. And at each of those levels, there are different risk factors and protective factors that influence our development. And um, what we know is that uh, being disconnected from school and from work is much more likely when young people are growing up in communities of poverty, when they're facing risk factors that include trauma, lack of connection and positive relationships with adults. Um, and on the, on the contrary, when we have supportive adults, teachers, peers, um, when we have uh, neighborhood safety and other resources, that can help us to thrive. Um, you can see in the middle of the figure that there's sort of a continuum from being connected to being sort of underattached or intermittently connected to being more, um, more severely disconnected. And, and young people may move back and forth um, through that continuum. And then finally, on the bottom of this figure, you can see that there are intervention approaches, policies, and strategies that we can use to help prevent young people from becoming disconnected and also to re-engage them if they do become disconnected. So using this guide as a framework for how we're approaching um, at uh, opportunity youth, and really our overarching goal is to reduce the number of opportunity youth, there's a number of strategies that we think that we can employ um, it within our public health field. And the first is really to think about coordinated data systems. Currently, right now, there's not a unified way of actually tracking and monitoring these young people. Part of the issue is that opportunity youth encompass a wide variety of different subpopulations. So we have within this group, we have kids that are aging out of foster care. We have homeless youth. We have parenting teens. All of these things have, are included in different sectors that Tamar was um, talking about on our conceptual framework. So what we really are hoping to do is that we can have a more of an integrated data system across these sectors that combines school with the health, um, with juvenile justice. And that way, a lot of these kids could be tracked over time and not fall through the cracks as they currently are. Related to this, we need a consolidated service delivery and funding um, strategy. Right now, um, disconnected youth are being um, funded through just very separate funding streams, again, coming from these different um, sectors, and there's not a consolidated way to blend these funds. Um, similarly with services, so we have services in each of these sectors that are not talking to each other. And so what we really hope to do with our public health tools is to really hopefully consolidate both these services and funding streams at the federal level and work our way down to the local level. One of the most important things that we've learned is really the um, listening to the voice of young people. As part of this initiative, we actually have our own youth advisory board, and their guidance to us has been inv is invaluable. And so one of the recommendations we have is with any of these issues, we need young people at the table helping us um, develop these strategies. And finally, um, the last thing is that as a nation, we really don't have a national policy for looking at how we systematically test interventions in the scale up. And this is something that's greatly needed, especially with the prevention and the re-engagement strategies that are currently um, underway with this population. So in summary, a public health pr approach really has potential to reduce the number of opportunity youth in this country and to bring down the high costs that we mentioned that are associated with young people becoming disconnected. We hope that if we do these things, we can actually harness their potential. If we can get them actually working and re-engaged, think of the opportunities that are not only for them, but also for the communities at large. 
And then ultimately, if we do this, we can really prevent and reduce these long-term health and behavioral problems that so often encompass their um, population. Great, thank you so much. Um, as we're uh, going to hold questions for the end, if you have questions now, though, you can still put them in to the questions section. And I'll just mention while our next speakers are coming up that um, if you're interested in following the American Health Initiative on Twitter, we are at American Health. So um, next we are joined by uh, Ann Barnhill and Ann Palmer, who uh, are two of the co-authors of the paper, uh, Grappling with Complex Food Systems to Reduce Obesity, a U.S. Public Health Challenge. So this is Ann Palmer, and I'm going to start out by talking about the scope of the problem. Um, obesity and overweight rates have increased sharply worldwide since the 1980s. Um, data from 2016 found that about 40% of adults in the United States were obese. Um, it obviously uh, affects different populations differently. 44% of American Indians and Native Alaskans are obese, so it's the highest rate, um, and the lowest being 29% of non-Hispanic white adults. Um, almost 20% of teenagers and children ages 2 to 19 were also classified as obese. And this obviously has big implications for public health in terms of um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, kidney disease, and several kinds of cancers. There's been a lot of effort at all different levels of government to enact policies and regulations. Several of these target kids in school or daycare settings, and the primary goals of most of these are to increase physical activity and change what um, children eat. Better regulations like chain and restaurant posting calories on menus would be one example. State policies to make school meals healthier. And then at the local level, we see cities that have implemented attacks on sugar sweetened beverages, and some that have even funded positions dedicated to work on food policy. In spite of all these efforts, the obesity rates continue to rise in the United States. Um, since our paper was submitted, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Trust for America's Health released a report in 2017 that found seven, in seven states the obesity rate increased at 2 or above 35%. The one bright spot in that report was there was actual decrease in obesity for children enrolled in WIC between um, 2011 and 2014. There's a lack of public consensus about what we should do for this problem. Most of the U.S. public sees it as a serious problem. But that has not necessarily translated into support for government intervention. A 2017 poll found that 31% of U.S. adults supported more regulatory action to address it, while 30% wanted less regulatory action. Um, obesity is connected, much like the environmental uh, challenges, obesity is connected to other food system problems and the need for policies that accomplish and balance multiple goals. And so that is a big challenge that we face. So in communities with high rates of obesity, you can also find malnutrition. There are also environmental issues with the food system. And food system accounts for a high proportion of all greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. And then to make it even more complicated, interventions can have unintended consequences. If we all follow the U.S. dietary guidelines to consume more fish, we would deplete global fish supplies and threaten fishers' livelihoods. So we want to make sure that we support policies that make progress on obesity and also have a positive environmental, economic, and social benefit. Great. Okay, this is Ann Barnhill now. To help grapple with the problem of obesity and this complex relationship to food systems that the other Ann was just describing, we recommend taking a systems approach. And taking a systems approach to a problem means understanding that the problem is part of a larger system that has many interrelated parts, and recognizing that the system may work in surprising ways. So an effort to solve a problem might be intuitively compelling, yet it might backfire or produce negative unintended consequences elsewhere in the system or produce positive unintended consequences. The field of system science has developed qualitative and quantitative methods that are used in systems approaches, including methods for mapping systems and modeling systems. Researchers have used these methods successfully in mathematics, engineering, the social sciences, and other areas of public health. And during the past decade, obesity researchers have begun to use these methods and to use systems approaches, and we think an even greater use of these approaches would be beneficial. So taking a systems perspective, 
we see obesity as embedded within a broader system, within a broader food system, which is itself embedded in larger social, economic, and political systems. So if you look at our figure, the way uh, we're, we conceptualized obesity in our paper is that a primary cause of obesity is overconsumption of food relative to energy needs. And this overconsumption occurs in contexts of consumption, such as homes or schools or retail environments. And these contexts of consumption are embedded in larger food systems. The prevailing view in public health is that there are features of food systems, such as how food is processed or how food is marketed, that push excess calories and lower quality food into contexts of consumption in ways that drive overconsumption and obesity. But this view needs to be corroborated, and we need to better understand how exactly food systems behave holistically and how they affect consumption and obesity. So what specific features of food systems are most strongly linked with overconsumption? What changes to food systems would help improve consumption patterns in different populations? And by helping us keep this whole system in view, a systems approach can help us to identify the relationship between food systems and go back. Yeah, sorry. Great. A systems approach can help us identify relationships between food systems and patterns of consumption, so we can identify those primary drivers of overconsumption. A systems approach can help us recognize unintended consequences of our efforts such as adverse health, environmental, and economic effects, and minimize those unintended consequences. A systems approach can help us design coordinated sets of policies that reinforce each other. And importantly, a systems approach helps us to understand the broader social, economic, and political context. And this lets us identify groups of people that might be affected by policies, both positively and negatively. So we can identify political obstacles to policy, and also we can identify common goals and build a broad alliance beyond public health for obesity efforts. So we'll conclude with some recommendations. Um, ideally, we want to target multiple parts and levels of the system. And so one example would be, we see a lot of interventions that are trying to increase access to healthy food in retail locations. And ideally, we'd want to be working with communities to stimulate demand for those products at the same time that we're working with retailers about what to stock and with wholesalers who sell to those retailers to ensure that those healthy items are affordable. We want to look at targeted population-specific interventions and look at the broader community context. We want to have a broader set of goals beyond changes in diet and obesity and a longer-term horizon. Long-term indicators of success would include not only changes in diet and obesity, but also indicators that improve community well-being in other ways, such as the higher employment rates and education indicators. And we also want to include community members in identifying the problems and solutions. Um, public health can really help advance this work by supporting interdisciplinary research products, projects, increasing opportunities for training and systems methods, and then a longer term commitment from funders to sustain projects that can be repeated, improved, and rigorously evaluated. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I just point out people can put in questions. And if you want open access to all the articles we're talking about, you can go to bit.ly slash amhealth, A M A T A L T H. So we are now going to move to the paper on Bions, and uh, we are with Michelle Decker. Um, and in the room, we have Daniel Webster and I believe Holly Wilcox. Yes, and Holly Wilcox. And um, Michelle is going to um, do a brief presentation of the paper and integrated public health approach to interpersonal violence and suicide prevention and response. Thanks, Michelle. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm thrilled to be here with many of my colleagues in this work. Um, I think we're all fairly well aware of the burden of violence in that homicide and suicide are leading causes of death for uh, youth and adults in the United States. We know that for women, intimate partners are responsible for over half of homicides to women. 
So there's a clear mortality issue that we're seeing. Uh, we also know that non-fatal experiences of violence really incur just a cascade of health, uh, physical health, sexual health, emotional health consequences, lost economic productivity, uh, gaps in accessing education systems, and so forth. Um, uh, we see that for certainly for intimate partner violence and sexual violence that affect a, a large number of women uh, every year in the United States. We see tremendous disparities in these experiences as, as well um, across lines of race, ethnicity, as well as gender. And across these forms of violence, we actually see that our youth are really disproportionately affected um, for homicide, suicide, as well as partner violence and sexual violence. So this really speaks to the need for systematic and really early intervention when we think about responding to and preventing these forms of violence. So I want to give you a couple of important frameworks for violence prevention and response. Um, the first uh, really illustrates what we think of as really the three pillars. And these are bringing our understanding of what's needed to both prevention of violence, primary and secondary prevention of violence, as well as broadening that lens to include survivor support, support for individuals that have experienced violence or witnessed violence, we're seeing that very clearly now um, on a national level when we look at uh, youth that are impacted by mass, sh mass shootings in schools, as well as chronic levels of violence in communities in places like Baltimore and beyond. We also see, uh, particularly for uh, partner violence, sexual violence, and, and, and community violence or homicide, there's an accountability element to this too that brings into uh, criminal justice systems um, and the need to really identify ways that are equitable to hold perpetrators accountable um, as a means of justice, as well as preventing re-victimization. So that's a, an important frame for us when we think about all of the sectors that need to come together for comprehensive violence prevention and response. And of course, um, the next framework also, um, thanks. Um, the next framework, this, this lens is familiar um, and really shared across these papers, I think, in looking at the individual determinants, but as well the interpersonal, community, and social structural determinants of violence, victimization, and perpetration. Having an understanding of these factors, um, and, and I won't go into them, but I encourage you to take a look at, at the paper if you're interested in delving into this. Um, at each of these levels really represents opportunities for early or um, early or late if needed intervention, and that's around our systems levels, it's around our social norms and policies, certainly it's around equity, and then at the individual level, it's around trauma-informed care, building empathy, building through those early interventions, some of our positive behavioral uh, supports and behavioral regulation that we've seen really can have a cascade impact across these forms of violence. And so what are some implications and some of the paths forward for making this progress? I think we see clearly from um, the socioecologic framework that we can really achieve many gains in violence prevention and response, certainly through behavioral interventions. Many of these really need to start early, working with our education systems, our home visiting systems in particular. Um, that universal programming for youth that can build behavioral regulation, positive behavior, and also really empathy building and resilience. Um, this can buffer against violence, and we've seen that clearly through a number of our programs. So this is really a priority area. So that's a universal approach. Um, we also see that targeted support is still necessary for individuals that are identified to be at high risk for violence or recidivism. So we need to be balancing those two elements. Certainly our policy and social environments really create the conditions for violence and therefore um, make a really nice lever for change. Um, and so that, that's around supporting survivors and witnesses through access to mental health services, social supports, and trauma-informed care. Um, and that's really the support element, as well as the social environment, making sure people feel comfortable talking to friends and family about um, to get support for violence experiences that they've witnessed um, or potentially have experienced. Certainly at the policy level as well, um, we see that changes in policy can really impart broad and lasting reductions in violence. Um, specifically firearm policy is a big lever here, and that's across um, community violence, homicide, suicide, as well as partner violence. So many of our firearm policies really, um, really at the crux of violence prevention and response. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Michelle. 
Um, again, people can put in questions. Uh, the whole supplement is available at bit.ly slash amhelp. Um, also mention that you can go to our website at americanhealth.jhu.edu. So we're now going to go to the last focus area um, and ask uh, Brendan Salona and Susan Sherman to briefly discuss their paper of public health strategy for the <coughs> opioid crisis. Thank you very much, Susan. Great. This is uh, Brendan Saloner, and thank you so much for having us today. So uh, before we uh, get into our framework, I wanted to just frame the issue uh, in terms of some data points. Uh, drug overdose is now the leading cause of injury death in the United States. Uh, that has been true for several years. It has surpassed uh, causes of death such as motor vehicle accidents. Um, and overdose death rates have actually increased uh, more than threefold since the late 1990s. 72,000 Americans now die of drug overdose. More than two thirds of those overdoses uh, have opioids identified as one of the drugs involved in the death. Um, and increasingly, those deaths are specifically associated with heroin and most recently with a synthetic drug called fentanyl. Uh, although this challenge has historically or in recent years been thought about in terms of a prescription opioid crisis, what we know is that prescription opioid um, deaths have actually started to level off since around 2012, which has corresponded with the decline in the number of prescriptions written for opioids. What has supplanted those deaths has been a surge in overdose deaths uh, related to heroin and fentanyl, as I said. Now, Overdose deaths are just the tip of the iceberg. For every individual who dies of an overdose, many more individuals are affected by things like non-fatal overdoses uh, with the symptoms of an opioid addiction or an opioid use disorder. And um, this challenge also has broad implications for American communities, including implications for first responders and for uh, children who are affected by parents who have an opioid use disorder. So. Um, I just want to quickly highlight uh, what we know about uh, some of the services and systems that have been activated in relation to this challenge. Um, just to say that uh, we know that uh, there remains substantial gaps in people's ability to access harm reduction services, uh, such as naloxone, the drug that reverses opioid overdose, syringe service programs, um, and the like, and that safe consumption spaces, which um, which has been a topic of increasing conversation, still do not legally exist in the United States. We also know that um, although there's a large population that's in need of treatment, only about one fifth of all people with opioid use disorder um, access treatment programs. There are very large portions of the country in which people do not have the ability to enter a treatment program because of geographic barriers and uh, limited access to uh, providers of medication-assisted treatments, such as buprenorphine and methadone specifically. And with that, I'll turn it over to Susan Sherman to talk about our framework. Thanks so much, Brendan, and thanks for listening to us today. Um, I just want to say before I start, we were really fortunate to have a mix of legal expertise in the law, sociology, epidemiology uh, in developing authors of our paper who helped develop a complex framework, which you can see, that looks at both the distal and proximal causes of morbidities and mortalities associated with opioid use. So first, I'm going to talk about why we felt this was necessary, and then I'll go into the details of our model. The national dialogue around opioids has really been dominated by several approaches that on their own are, in, are inadequate or even harmful um, that I'm going to touch on. The first that probably comes to mind, we think about public health campaigns um, lived through policing and the criminalization of drugs, is that of the war on drugs that really uh, focuses and is grounded in increasing arrests and incarceration to deter drug use. Um, and unfortunately, this has not been the case at all, and as a byproduct, has really had long-term negative and scarring impact upon many communities in the U.S., primarily the communities of color, without many measurable positive outcomes in the reduction of street 
uh, drugs and rather created a class of citizens who can't vote, don't, access, don't have access to many jobs, et cetera. So you really can't talk about, um, it's the antithesis of a public health approach, but unfortunately it has been a dominant framework. Similarly, it's important to note that a lot of people think of drug use as an individual moral failing that can be fixed through willpower or is only based in the biology within a person, which really takes the emphasis off a society that creates a world in which there are neighborhoods where really the only jobs available are that in the drug industry. Or we have a society that's so lonely that there are articles about loneliness everywhere. And of course, drug use is a way for people um, in the short term to somehow feel connected or to feel disconnected uh, from the pain that they have from things like adverse childhood events. So um, this focus on the individual really fails to put the spotlight out on broader factors that we as a society are responsible for. So to move into our framework, which is a sociological framework, which really is based on um, McElroy's socio-ecological framework that focuses on health outcomes that result from the interaction of individual, institutional, community, and policy factors. Our framework draws attention to the multiple determinants of drug use and emphasizes the role of upstream factors that drive addiction overdose and associated harm. So not just looking at the drug supply, but also the role of employment and unemployment, people's um, access to education, material deprivation over time, childhood and adulthood, physical and sexual violence, homelessness. Um, and central in, this, uh, in our iteration is the interaction between individuals' drug use and the context in which they use drugs particularly focusing on opioids, um, when people inject drugs, they're more likely to result in negative outcomes when people inject drugs in unsafe environments, whether research has been shown that if people inject in public places or use drugs in public places versus safe consumption spaces, as Brendan mentioned, which are not, there are no legally, legally sanctioned safe consumption spaces in the US, they're much more likely to experience arrests, receptive syringe sharing, or an overdose. So we feel that this factor, this framework really looks at upstream structural factor factors um, that both have policy and programmatic implementations and try to bring this public health multidisciplinary, multi-level uh, approach into our conceptualization and therefore the levers that are necessary to respond to the opioid epidemic. So aligned with uh, Susan's observation that we tried to engage um, a broad authorship group, we ended up looking at priorities that go beyond uh, clinical or even traditional public health to think about a variety of ways in which strategies could be leveraged that take advantage of the complexity of this challenge across uh, multiple um, arenas of social systems and um, the criminal justice system. So, but at the top of this uh, is a priority on data collection. One of the uh, key findings from our work is that there are massive gaps in our data collection infrastructure that limit our ability to engage evidence-based responses to the opioid crisis. Uh, things like building overdose tracking into existing sentinel surveillance systems would allow us to understand in a more real-time manner where there are hot spots and how to respond to them. Similarly, we see a lot of promise in the creation of data dashboards that can help create uh, linked information systems that can also be used for communities to understand what their profile of risks are and whether they are in fact making improvements. Um, although, as I noted, the, uh, the death rates associated with prescription opioids have declined, we are by no means out of the woods in our prescription opioid crisis. We see a continued role for safer prescribing that would, among other things, increase physician and patient awareness of the risks of opioids as well as their benefits, of which there are certainly some. And uh, critically, to integrate addiction treatment with pain management. The populations that these two systems engage are very overlapping, but unfortunately, they exist in very different uh, arenas. Stigma reduction was another uh, point that was very uh, important to our understanding of this challenge. The language that we use to speak about addiction has a powerful way of shaping the public's understanding of this challenge and indeed then creating an environment in which people do not feel safe 
to access services that will help improve their lives. So we see destigmatization of addiction as the linchpin of any state, national, or local uh, um, approach to addressing the opioid crisis. We also see uh, broad opportunities to scale up harm reduction. Um, although there's greater interest in take up of uh, naloxone, there's many places where it's difficult to access naloxone. Similarly, there are many communities where the laws make it prohibitive for syringe service programs to operate. And as we noted, safe consumption facilities still do not exist in the United States, despite their promise shown in countries like Canada and Australia. Uh, treatment expansion is also a critical issue. Although we see the federal government taking an increasing interest in this topic, we think that much bolder steps could be taken to offer universal access in a low threshold way, meaning that people can use services at the time that they need it in a place that's convenient for them. We also see a lot of burdensome regulations around treatment, hindering people's access to get effective medications like methadone. Finally, we see a big role for changes within the criminal justice system, a place where many people who use opioids end up experiencing adverse encounters that often increase their risk of overdose. So we see opportunities at the front end of the justice system to expand diversion programs to keep people out of jail, and opportunities to provide medication to people once they're in jail and prison and to continue their treatment experiences once they leave these facilities. We think that taken together, this package of strategies has real potential to finally begin to uh, stem the tide of this uh, very unprecedented public health crisis. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So we're um, now going to um, transition to the papers that had to do with the cross-cutting themes of the uh, initiative and the themes that kind of inform all five of the responses to these major challenges. Um, and uh, we're going to first talk about policy, one of our themes. Um, Dr. Pollock Porter, who is the lead author of the paper, is not here, but we are joined by, M uh, by Beth Nganty. Thank you so much, Beth, for coming, one of the authors. And um, could you uh, give us your sense? Why is policy so, such an important uh, factor across multiple different public health domains? Absolutely, thanks for having me. We tried to do three main things in this brief piece. The first was to define policy, which is not just legislation. I think it's often thought of as policy equals legislation, but that's not the case. There's also regulatory policy, um, you know, judicial policy, executive orders are an example of policy, and of course there's also institutional policies, and so we thought it was important to lay the groundwork there. Our second goal of this piece was to discuss the key role of policy change in public health problems. Policy change is really integral in addressing all of the different public health problems that you've just heard about that are the focus of the initiative. And then we put forth four principles for effective public health policy change, which are what you see on the slide. So I'll spend just a bit of time on each of these. The first principle was the starting point, we should use evidence to inform policy. I think a key takeaway here is that not only should we use evidence to inform policy, we should produce evidence to inform policy. Uh, we often you know, have a mismatch between what policymakers feel like they need to know in order to make policy change and what the evidence tells them. A classic example of that is we have national surveillance data and state and local Policymakers really want to know, well, what's the, what's the public health problem in my community? I can't act without that. The second principle is to consider health equity in policy change, um, both in terms of considering policies that dismantle underlying sources of inequity in our system that contribute to the public health problems that we're focused on. An example of this is long-standing development and housing policies that have contributed to racial residential segregation in the U.S., which contribute to multiple of the problems discussed here today, including you know, issues around drug markets and opioids, as well as gun violence. The third principle that we put forth is to design policy with implementation in mind. And so two key points there 
thinking about as you're proposing a policy, what exactly is involved in implementation as an existing agency going to do this? Does this involve creation of a new agency, which of course has big implications in terms of funding, as well as the importance of including implementers in the policy design process. Who's going to be responsible for carrying this policy out? They should have a say in how the policy is formulated. And then finally, our fourth recommendation was to use proactive research policy translation strategies. So from a researcher's perspective, don't wait for the legislator to call you up and ask for testimony. Um, from a policymaker's perspective, don't uh, wait for the researcher to knock on your door, but to think about whether there are models to better tie researchers and policymakers together throughout the research and policy translation process, um, of which I think the initiative is a prime example of sort of a proactive strategy that is working to do that. Thanks very much. Great, fantastic. Thanks so much, uh, Beth. To talk briefly about um, the paper that is um, in this supplement on equity, um, which was uh, authored by a group led by uh, Dr. Lisa Cooper. I'm going to turn to uh, Michelle Spencer, who's here with us. Great, thanks, Josh. So um, as Josh mentioned, the work of Dr. Lisa Cooper and many others as it relates to this paper on major public health challenges, the importance of equity, we know that despite efforts uh, to address health disparities, only modest improvements um, have been made in reducing health disparities at the national level. We know um, that as, for example, in Baltimore City, even five miles makes a world of a difference in terms of whether you live, for example, in Roland Park or if you live in Madison East End. We know that in Roland Park, for example, there's a, a 80 three-year uh, life expectancy versus those who may live in Madison East End with the 64-year um, life expectancy, certainly um, attributing to uh, the importance of equity and, and health equity. Um, health equity, we know, is has to be a, an explicit priority in order to really address any of our five focus target areas. Um, we know that there has to be intentionality around engaging cross-sectoral areas such as businesses, transportation, academia, um, as well as the healthcare system, um, as well as faith-based community, planning agencies, um, and certainly government. Um, the paper also focuses on the, the aspects of training and education, um, policy translation, and the important components of addressing health equity in terms of health impact assessment, and certainly um, program evaluation. We also know that um, collaboration among practitioners, researchers, and educators are also critical to addressing equity uh, and certainly informing uh, policy and policy translation. Great, thanks so much, Michelle. Um, the last paper that we're gonna be discussing is called Bringing Evidence to Bear on Public Health in the United States. It was written by Kevin Callahan and uh, Dr. Elizabeth Stewart. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview because neither, neither of them could join us today. Um, but I think this is a particularly relevant one to end on, given that this uh, webinar is sponsored by ASPCH, because it is um, schools and programs of public health that generate a lot of the evidence that um, is really important to make progress in public health. And yet, as this paper points out, there's a bit of a gap between the evidence that comes out of schools and studies and NIH and other agencies and the data and information that people in the field who really are responsible for addressing these problems need. Um, and uh, the way that the, the authors wrote that is that there's a gap between the answers policymakers and practitioners need for decision making and the answers that the most rigorous and reliable studies can provide, and they explain that even randomized controlled studies and systematic reviews are rarely designed to show how an intervention works or to evaluate its acceptability and appropriateness. They may provide accurate results, but um, are not necessarily um, giving results in a way that can permit the most effective implementation. So the paper kind of takes that as a starting point and says, how can we bring evidence on the one hand and the real world closer together. And the um, uh, examples that they give include um, alternative 
ways of doing studies, not just doing the initial randomized controlled study or even just doing the pre-post study, which um, that happens to be my favorite paragraph of this paper, which is where they talk about how oftentimes people in the uh, in health agencies think that the right way to do evaluation is just look before and then after pre-post and see whether things have gotten better. And it's not a very strong study design. So they suggest alternative ways to find out whether an intervention really worked. It may be it, you know, that it wasn't just due to chance or due to some other factor that intervened. And I'm not going to go into all the details of the types of studies they talk about, but the paper really gives practical suggestions on how studies can be designed that are um, able to be implemented in public health agencies. In addition, they suggest combining results from more traditional studies with population-based data in order to um, predict the effects, for example, of statewide implementation of a particular intervention. And they talk about using alternative sources of data, such as um, Google search terms, administrative data, and other kind of data that are around. Um, and a part of their call here is for, the, for schools and programs of public health to get in there and to work with practitioners to find data that they're using and see what can be put to use to help guide more effective strategies. Um, the last thing I'd say is they want to encourage dialogue. They want to encourage researchers to listen to policymakers about what kinds of evidence that uh, what would be helpful. And they want to encourage uh, practitioners to listen to researchers about what the right thing to do is and uh, based on the data, um, and particularly where there is uh, information showing that a particular course of action is unlikely to work. Um, and hopefully, um, one of the things the Bloomberg American Health Initiative is fostering, not just ourselves here at Johns Hopkins, but in coordination as we work with a whole bunch of different schools and programs of public health, um, to close the gap between local policymakers and local academic experts, we can help um, bring more evidence to bear on public health in the United States. So um, that is the wrap up on the three cross-cutting areas. Um, it's been really uh, great to hear the um, uh, various uh, papers presented succinctly and really get a sense of the scale of uh, the challenges that we're facing. And I think. Um, we're going to shift to um, some questions, so I certainly encourage people to put questions in the box. If you are listening and you have any questions, please do so. Um, and we will get started with a few questions here. So um, one question that um, I would like to maybe ask the um, three researchers on violence, perhaps, to come up, um, Daniel, uh, Holly, and Michelle. One of the aspects of your article dealt with the intersection between three types of violence, community violence, intimate partner violence, and suicide. And I, I guess um, I'd be, you know, the question is um, why you chose to look at the, those intersections and what concretely, you know, did you find when you looked at those intersections that could be useful uh, to addressing violence? There's a lot of overlap between the three types of violence that we focused on. And one thing that we um, found was that there are programs that impact um, two or, or maybe even three types of violence. And so there's potential for making public health impact across the different types of violence. Yeah, the risk factors are very similar. Uh, firearms, of course, play an important role in the lethality component uh, across these three forms of violence. Um, alcohol um, and substance abuse also plays an important role. Um, so there are a number of different opportunities for prevention, as Holly indicated, um, where I think um, we can have impacts uh, across multiple multiple forms and types of violence, including suicide. And just a way, and I think some of the, um, we set out to do this in part to see where those synergies really were. We know these forms of violence are really closely interrelated. Um, we see that in, you know, partner violence, homicide, suicide. We see that in, you know, even some of the recent examples we've seen in the news about 
violence perpetrators that may be um, presenting in one one form of violence also have a history of other kinds of forms of violence. So, so really, what works? And I think the evidence points so clearly to you know two real things. I mean, you know, the early um, the early interventions um, that we really wanted to kind of lift up and the need to sort of start early in life and focus on youth, as well as firearm policy. Those were really two of the biggest sort of cross cutting across the forms of abuse. And of course, there are. Um, some, some differentiation points as well, um, but we saw a lot of synergy that I don't think we always talk about in violence prevention and response. And one of the hopes that we have from this from this paper and this analysis was that people would start to see some of those synergies a little bit more um, a little bit more clearly, um, and some of the shared threads around perhaps community mobilization um, and school based strategies. There are there is a lot of shared ground there, but we do tend to work in silos. Great. Um... Thank you very much. Uh, one of the questions was just to repeat one more time the free link where you can go to to get the whole um, journal, and that is bit.ly, b as in boy, it.ly slash amhealth, amhealth, all lowercase, and uh, that should work. And it'll be on the screen in a minute. Um, I have a next question is for um, the adolescent team here. Um, if you guys want to come up for a second. Um, and this question is, um, one of the uh, concepts in your paper is that health departments uh, should be thinking about um, high-risk adolescents, kind of like health departments generally already think about um, the challenges of maternal child health and healthy birth outcomes. Um, that they are, these aren't about, you know, individuals entirely. It's really, you know, people think about birth outcomes as, way, you know, community-wide strategies and different kinds of programs that actually prevent the adverse birth outcomes. So if you're applying that framework and trying to convince a health department to think about the issue of opportunity youth like this, what, what would be the an example or examples of the kinds of strategies where you would want to use to prevent adolescent disconnection? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the striking things is that this, this really is a population health problem, and 12% of young people are actually disconnected. So about one in nine young people experience disconnection. Uh, and just to add to that, do we think that number is actually underreported? Because only those that get counted are really, they have to be part of the census. So you think of the kids that are in any institutions or in the juvenile justice system, they're not part of this. So that number is a lot higher. So when I think for health departments, in terms of you know really thinking about promoting health, that this is a significant segment of the population and it's facing incredible health risks. And in terms of actions that health departments can take, um, you know there's a terrific example happening now in Baltimore City, which is um, a collaboration between um, the Mayor's Office of Employment Development, Baltimore City Schools. Um, and a collective called Baltimore's Promise to actually get um, high school seniors who are graduating but not intending to go to college to enroll in job training programs that would actually provide them with skills and supports to then get jobs with livable wages. And I think that's an example of sort of a multi-sector effort that a city could take um, and that is likely to have very significant health benefits for young people. I mean, kind of related to that, one of the things that also is happening here is that they're in the process of developing an integrated data system with the health department really taking a major role in that. And so I think that's a great example of, again, how do we treat this as a population rather than these separate groups? And that's kind of the problem that I think a lot of us have had, or how health departments have had, is we tend to think of them as just separate, distinct groups, homeless youth, juvenile justice groups, and we don't think of them as having this overarching common risk factor being disconnected. And so having this integrated data system that the health department is actually trying to implement is one example of how we can bridge these sectors together to really focus on this population. It can be, it can be used to address this population. And I think it's sort of a thread through a lot of these um, challenges and papers is the need for multi-sectoral approaches and health departments are critical in that. Great, um, thank you very much. Um, Next question that we're, we've got relates to the American Health Initiative challenges and how they relate to the curriculum. Um, and so I would 
briefly say that here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, we're actually developing a number of courses, many of which are now available in each of these areas. Um, there are new courses on opioids. There um, are new courses on equity. Um, uh, Holly is going to teach a course on suicide soon. Um, and uh, we um, are seeing a tremendous enthusiasm, really, for uh, students. I taught a course on opioids that um, we had like 30 extra students and wound up being 80 students at the end um, sign up for just because these are very timely topics. These are things that really matter to this country. Um, I wanted to ask maybe uh, Tom Burke to come back here for a second because another aspect of the curriculum is the ability to make some of the materials that the initiative is developing uh, more broadly available. And you um, have recently developed a course that is now um, available online, and there are going to be some other ones. And so maybe would you want to just mention that? Well, sure. And, and uh, it's called a MOOC, a massive online something course. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, working, working with our partner, Coursera, uh, with the support of the initiative, we developed a course um, really to reach frontline people and students throughout the world in a very free or low cost way uh, to address the issues of protecting public health in a time of changing climate. Not to get caught up in, in uh, regulation or, or the arguments of, of politics and science denial, but for public health professionals, frontline people, to really apply the principles that you heard today that were the common threads between uh, really all the topic areas to improve the practice of public health. And Josh, one other thing I want to mention that's very exciting hearing all of these papers presented together, you see those common threads of cross-sectoral, cross-disciplinary systems approach, data and surveillance, things that are they're kind of fragmented in public health right now, but that show us just how important it is to pull this together. And another thing I'm really looking forward to working on and, and, uh, and have already initiated is a new PRPH program that builds upon these critical areas and the intersections that we've seen here today to refine our curriculum and to have through our DRPH program in a concentration in policy that will draw upon this incredible expertise and address our toughest problems. And part of this question is whether this relates specifically to CEPH criteria for accreditation of schools of public health. And I think CPH um, hasn't specifically adopted these five challenges, but I think, you know, personally, I will just say over time, part of what we want is for curricula to be relevant, to train people to be able to address the critical challenges in the country. And um, we hope through the initiative to be putting together educational materials that will really help with our students well. I wanted to ask maybe Beth, if you could come up for a second for the next question. One of the questions is about advocacy and um, tips for those of us in the advocacy space who are often well positioned to connect the research and policy maker communities. And um, you were uh, one of the authors of the policy paper, talk a lot about all the different kinds of policy out there, not just legislators, but different ways. Um, what, what advice do you have for people listening who are interested in these issues and want to see policy change? Yeah, I think this is a great point. You know, I think that advocacy groups are uniquely well positioned to serve as really effective intermediaries between researchers, researchers and policymakers. Excuse me, we give an example in the paper of a, a group called the Consortium for Risk-Based Firearm Policy, which is a partnership between a, a group of gun violence prevention researchers, including Daniel Webster, who you heard from, um, and a national advocacy group that's specifically interested in advancing evidence-based firearm policy. Um, and you know why I think this works so well is that advocates have a lot of reach into the policy world. They have skills that researchers don't have in terms of you know communicating with policymakers. They have networks of policymakers. And so I think that I think that big picture of the model is great. In terms of specific tips you know, of how to do this, I think that um, increasing partnerships between advocacy groups or foundations, I think, are also really well positioned to play this role. We see examples of that with the initiative, clearly. Um, but increasing uh, the sort of integrated collaboration among researchers and advocacy groups to think about 
who are the target audiences, how might we best communicate research evidence to those audiences. Researchers know what the evidence is, but we don't always know the best communication strategies, and I think advocates often do. Um, and so I think that there's a real sweet spot there in terms of building those types of collaborations. Great, thank you. I may ask um, Ann Palmer and Brendan Lohner to come up for a mix and match question here. <laughs> Um, related to this, which is um, both of you uh, work in academic environments that spend a lot of time working with uh, organizations or policymakers on a particular uh, topic. And I wonder if you can maybe very briefly discuss an, an example of that and um, how you have tried to bring evidence and, you know, what's uh, known into more of a context where you're trying to bridge the gap with, with policymakers and, and make change. Um, and either one of you can, can start, Brennan. Okay, sure. Uh, so one of the real thrills of getting to work um, as part of this Bloomberg American Health Initiative is the chance to engage um, stakeholders and state government around this opioid crisis. One of the, um, one of the things that's taught me is that uh, Publishing studies is actually an easy job for academics compared to addressing the challenges that people who live and breathe these challenges and actually have to come up with solutions have. It's so, so humbling to um, talk to people who um, don't only need evidence, they need a real kind of playbook for how to get from the evidence that you know works to their particular environment and doing that translational work. But I think the other thing that um, has been really impressed upon me is that as researchers, we often come with a certain amount of scientific credibility, and that can be so valuable around um, health issues where there's a lot of ideological valence. So to take an example from opioids, um, we know that the medications to treat opioid use disorder are highly effective, they're safe, they, um, they really need to be widely scaled up. And a lot of people in state government get that and appreciate it, but they are dealing with constituencies where there's just deeply held stigma against the medications. So to give an example, I won't name the state, but in the state that we've been working in, we've uh, had the ability to come in and go to um, community meetings and be asked to provide scientific evidence. That scientific evidence is being provided in a way that is strategically designed to help the policymakers bolster the case for enacting the policies they know will be effective. But because we are seen as being objective, impartial, and outside the state context, we have that degree of freedom to really come in and, and speak um, from the perspective of science. So I'll talk about um, some examples of work we do with food policy councils around the United States. So there are about 284 active food policy councils. Most of these operate at the local level, county, multi-county, um, sometimes they're just in a city, about 8% of them work at the state level. And we do a lot of capacity building with these groups. Most of the time, these, these are very diverse stakeholder groups. So you're trying to get people from different sectors together in a room. They're not coming in with, with the coalition model, like we're gonna fix child obesity. They have multiple areas that they're trying to work on. Um, so one example of this would be, there, we see a lot of people, you know, active in this space around policy and around programs to improve healthy food retail. The evidence on if you improve the availability of healthy food, is that gonna actually have a, um, an impact? It is very weak. It, is, it, it does account for some percentage of it, but it doesn't account for a lot. And so the challenge for a lot of these groups is how do they act within their jurisdictional boundaries? They're working with policymakers. They have, sometimes they have employees of state government or city government, municipal government participating, they have health department folks. They, so they have to have like active in that jurisdictional boundary, but they also wanna do things that are effective. So it's in part getting them to figure out how do you work on issues when you know that it's not it's not going to be a very simple causal response that you know the people's educational levels and income and you know where they live there's all kinds of things that actually influence what people buy and what they eat and so it isn't enough just to work on supply so we use evidence to help them kind of make the case for how do you incentivize healthy food purchasing and how do you look at all these various mechanisms and we do that we've done a lot of work in Baltimore City around that um, and worked at that geographic level to look at where do we see the areas of greatest need. So I think that would be. Great. Um, if anyone has any other questions, please put them put them in now. Um, 
I um, have a question here which says, this is an incredible compilation of work. What is next? Um, we appreciate your question deeply. Yeah, this was a lot of work, um, and not just by the people in this room, but co-authors from around the country. Um, it was also an awful lot of work by public health before, so that I should point out, and which we deeply appreciate. Um, uh, we hope that uh, the journal is helpful um, and that the articles are, are resources for people. Um, there's a lot going on, um, both with the American Health Initiative here in Baltimore, but in the work that we do with uh, a number of places around the country and all the different types of projects that we're talking about, from food policy councils to, for example, the work that um, uh, Brendan has done in, in different states um, is on our website at americanhealth.jhu.edu. So you, you can hear about it. Um, we're also available by email, americanhealth.jhu.edu. And um, uh, if people have questions or have ideas for um, how to collaborate with us on any of these topics, we're very interested in knowing that. Um, I think, uh, here we go, let's see. We have the uh, website there, that's nice. And I think we have, whoops. Um, we also have here, um, yes, there it is, the actual link to the supplement, um, so I don't have to say it again, um, which is uh, bit.ly slash amhealth with the wonderfully helpful pointer circling it right now by somebody. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I'll also say that our podcast, the American Health Podcast, has um, an episode about the um, about this supplement, so you can... Uh, hear more on your way to and from work or whenever you listen to podcasts and um uh we are again on on twitter for little things at, at american health um i guess i should um close our portion by uh just thanking everybody for joining today and thanking again to dr shah and to andre Zudnichev and others at public health reports for their great collaboration on this special issue thank you very much Okay, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. A special thanks to the speakers and their staff members for their time and contributions addressing the major health challenges facing the United States today. I also want to thank the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, uh, the Public Health Reports, my own journal, and the Office of the U.S. Surgeon General for their uh, support. Uh, just a reminder that anyone seeking one credit for certification in public health continuing education practice, you will need a password for the credit. The password for this webinar is CHALLENGE, the word CHALLENGE, C-H-A-L-L-E-N-G-E, -E, CHALLENGE. And the next slide, please. Uh, so we've come to the end. This is the end of the ASPPH Presents Public Health Reports Meet the Author webinar. As a reminder, this webinar will be archived on the ASPPH website for future viewing. Thank you all, and good day to everyone.